two guys here. We'll be here for two weeks. So it will be an amazing course, I think, the longest one in the advanced module, which is really, really cool. Uh, and I'm going to introduce both of them, and both of them will be sharing the, the classes, okay? So it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Martina Dalbello. Uh, Martina Dalbello has a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences from Universitat degli Studi di Genova in Italy, a master's degree in marine biology from Universitat di Pisa, also in Italy, and a PhD in ecology from the same university. After that, Martina became a postdoc researcher at the Universitat di Pisa, moving to MIT in the US, uh, where she's currently a research scientist. Uh, Martina is, is interested in community ecology, especially in the drivers of the diversity and structure of bacterial communities. She investigates how the environment, uh, for instance, nutrients, temperature, shapes interspecific interactions, and the assembly of microbial communities, using both experiments, experiments with simplified communities and data from natural microbiomes. And Jacopo Grilli. So Jacopo Grilli is a physicist by training, so we have a good mix here. Uh, with a bachelor's degree in physics from Università degli Studi di Milano in Italy, a master's degree from the same university, and a PhD degree in physics from Università di Padova, also in Italy. After that, Jacopo was a postdoc researcher at the University of Chicago in the US, followed by another postdoc in Santa Fe Institute, also in the US. Currently, he's associate research officer in quantitative life sciences at the ICTP in Trieste in Italy. So the same version here, but in Italy. The first one, actually. <laughs> He's interested in understanding complex phenomena, uh, starting from simple rules and minimal assumptions, mainly in the interface between statistical physics and ecology, with a particular focus on coexistence, stability, and variability. So help me to welcome these two guys. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, um, so, yes. okay. Hello everyone, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Of course, so the title of our course is Microbial Ecology in Theory and in Reality, because as Flavia just told you, Jacopo focuses most on theory and I focus most on reality. <laughs> um, yeah, we had a slide just uh, to remind you uh, who we are, what we do, what's our background, but of course Flavia just told you everything. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to know is actually what's, what is your background? So for example, who has a physics or math background here? All right. And who has instead a biology, microbiology background? Great. Mm -hmm. And um, what about microbial ecology? Who is familiar with microbial ecology? Uh, Perfect. <laughs> Great. It makes sense. Oh, no, no, okay, okay, it's fine. Uh, good, good, good. Um, all right, so before, s oh, sorry. Before starting, we just wanted to give you an overview of what we will be doing in these uh, two weeks. Uh, it's quite ambitious because, uh, again, this course wants to be introductory uh, to microbial ecology, but also quite advanced, and then Jacopo will talk more, more about this. But so, uh, we have planned a total of eight lectures uh, that uh, combine, again, uh, a couple of the lectures that I will do are mostly about uh, uh, knowledge of microbial communities and experiments, uh, and Jacopo will instead will cover more the theory, and our idea is to try to go in parallel with observations and theory and how these two intertwine. And, uh, and then we have planned two discussions on two hot topics in microbial community ecology. One is the dichotomy between oligotrophs and copiotrophs. Maybe now these names will not mean anything to you, but hopefully they will in a while. And finally, also the other hot topic is the prevalence of positive or negative uh, species interactions. And now Jacopo will tell you a bit um, more yes. about the syllabus. Yes, so the, um, as Martina said, this is like a 
I mean, I think it's a very experimental uh, course for us, but it's an experiment we'd like to run. Um, and the experiment is twofold. So there is, uh, it's experimental in the sense that uh, it's an introductory course. So we assumed uh, correctly that you, di you didn't have uh, previous exposure to microbial ecology. So we want you to introduce these things. But as you will see <coughs> in the syllabus that we'll send you today, the references are like, uh, most of them are like references in the last uh, 10, 20 years. And this is not because microbial ecology didn't exist before, as Martina will uh, explain uh, today as a long history and tradition, but it's because there, there has been a substantial revolution in the last uh, 30 years, driven mainly by techniques uh, and the uh, amount of data really major, measured in uh, terabytes, right? So, and, uh, what we believe is that, okay, so we want to give you, you this introduction, but also to expose you to what are the, what is at the edge of the field, what are the challenges. And what we believe uh, strongly, and I think it's the reason why we are uh, on the same stage uh, today, is that uh, um, what is at the edge and uh, what uh, it really needs to be done in, uh, in microbial ecology is uh, to, um, sort of uh, try to develop uh, um, an, uh, an understanding of the general principles and the general properties and what are the invariance properties of these, uh, of these communities and this can only be done uh, by combining different expertise. Right? And uh, since we believe that uh, this is like a sort of, we need to put together like, uh, as you are in the class, right? This is beautiful also because of that we need to, to combine this expertise. And if we really believe that, we have to go like uh, back and forth between the two. So there is a general goal uh, here, which is uh, in some sense beyond uh, uh, microbial ecology, which is the hope to try to uh, become familiar on how to, to connect uh, like observations and experimental data with, uh, with modeling. So is uh, an experiment for us. So we are happy to, to do it together with you. So um, this is uh, also means I think that it's important to have uh, like th that we don't spend uh, all the time like just talking but there is a lot of uh, discussion and uh, questions and uh, even if we don't cover all the topics that's, uh, that's okay what that's is fine. important is that we also have um, uh, yeah, discussion yeah. anything else uh, no the only thing is that yeah. we will give we will send probably to m today a full version of the syllabus with actually all the different topics uh, and but the the base so the, the basis of the syllabus is here um, I will send it today all right so uh, this is the plan for today um, today is really introductory uh, we will try to see so the questions that we want to answer are who are microbes why do we study them? Is there a reason why we, there are a lot of people focusing on microbes? And finally, how do we study microbes? And so the idea is that it's going to be, again, introductory. So it's um, an overview of uh, uh, relevant numbers in microbial ecology, uh, relevant processes that are mediated by microbes, and finally, a sort of uh, flight on the, all the techniques that, that have been developed uh, from the si 16th century to the 19th century where there has been the actual revolution about uh, microbial ecology. And um, so first I want to just tell you something about uh, what are the cell properties that uh, are important when we want to think about microbial ecology. So, uh, these are not like, these are pretty basic things, but it's still good to remember them. So basically, all cells share some uh, pivotal properties. So the first one is that cells are a sort of open environment. So they harvest energy from the outside, they convert it into biomass, and uh, for, for the law of uh, uh, biomass conservation, what is not converted into biomass is, ex is, excreted, is excreted outside. So it's an open system where 
uh, well, I wrote compartmentalization because cells are units that are separated from the environment but are in constant communication with it, and this communication with the environment is mediated by microbial metabolism. The second property is growth. Uh, for bacteria and for bacterial cells and microbial cells in general, what we mean with growth is actually division. So it's not like for other uh, organisms um, uh, that growth also means, uh, means in, um, I don't know, for example, increasing biomass of the cell itself. In this case, it would be cellular elongation. Uh, but what we mean by growth is actually division. So from one cell, we get two. And finally, another property that is common to all cells is evolution. So the idea is that there has been a common ancestor uh, from which uh, during the course of the years, well, ages actually, uh, all the different species that we see today evolved. And finally, there are instead properties that only some cells share. And mostly, uh, the first one is motility. So some cells are able to uh, move uh, in the environment. For example, they have flagella that allow them to swim, for example, following gradients. But this is not a property that characterizes all cells. Finally, there is, uh, there is another property, it's called differentiation, uh, which means that mostly, um, if you think about humans, we have uh, tissues where uh, different cells, uh, so the cells of one tissue differ from the cells of another tissue, and they, make different, they have different functions. Usually it's not the case for bacterial cells, except, except for those, those species that are actually able to differentiate. And one example of differentiation is the production of spores that allow bacteria to overcome moments of famine, of disaster, catastrophe, and so this is a dormant stage. And finally, last one is communication. So some uh, bacteria are able to release in the environment cues that can be picked up by uh, uh, cells of the same species and uh, used to coordinate. For example, a, well, this process is known as quorum sensing and it's extremely important, for example, for virulence. So when there are infections, quorum sensing can play a huge role in uh, uh, driving this process. So these properties all affect the way cell, uh, microbial, microbial species interact with the environment and how the environment shape their interactions. But since the course is just two weeks, we mostly are going to cover uh, these two properties. So mainly metabolism and how metabolism affects species interactions and community outcomes, and also growth. So what are the, uh, the environmental constraints on growth and how these affect uh, community outcomes. Uh, now what, what we envision to do is try to do an exercise. And the idea is that, um, let's say that we want to know how many bacterial cells are there on Earth. On Earth. And uh, I want, we want you to think about what thought process you can use to estimate uh, uh, this number. And for example, we, we, we can divide in groups and you can discuss together for 10 minutes and then we see what numbers come up. If some of you already know the number, Maybe just think about what kind of back of the envelope calculation you can do to actually uh, derive this number. Okay? I don't, I don't know, you can split in four groups. As I said. What you know now. <laughs> Which can be. And without Google, of course.
I mean, of, one important thing. So, of course, we don't we don't uh, want to know the precise number to the integers because so it's an obvious point. But the goal is to say the order of magnitude. Okay. Sorry for the. <laughs>
We have one minute left, so it's time to one minute. No, 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 no interactions between groups. No? All right. It's time. Are you guys ready? Okay. Group one. Group two. Lower bound. Yes, lower bound. Three? Twenty-eight. Four? All right. Um, can each of you explain really briefly, not each, each group briefly, how you got that, that number? We thought two ways. The first one was counting the number of bacteria of, of just going on the minimal estimate, counting the number of bacteria per people and then multiplying by people, and that was 10 to the 20. And mm -hmm. then we calculated the second approach was just the surface of the Earth, mm -hmm. and then we got the number of 10 to the 26, and we chose the bigger one. Okay. Uh, but so what was the starting? So what? Well, but how did you multiply the surface of the Earth? So what was the number? We divided by the area of one E. coli. Okay, interesting. Nice. Okay. We did the same calculation as they did. Like we said, uh, okay, so the, the least, the, like the lowest bound you can imagine is that you cover the earth with bacteria and, and the, that should be enough, right? So, so there should be more than enough to do that. So that's kind of Okay, no, 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 that's, that's, a good, that's a good way of thinking. Group three, same. Uh, we, we started using the fact that uh, there are more or less the same number of human cells and microbial cells in human body and these numbers is uh, 30 trillion we multiplied by the population of earth and we estimated like how many bacteria there are in mammals associated in mammals and we estimated this number to be like one in a one bacteria that exists like one for every thousand is associated with you uh, with mammals or one in 10,000, I don't remember <laughs> what we decided at the end, but it's, it was this. Okay, four. <laughs> in your case, it was totally a guess. So we had more or less a million of bacteria in each human. We multiplied by the number of humans. And it was more or less at the power of 15. And from this, we know it's above this. So we can set a number from this. OK, so the other question that I have for you is, so then where do you think that most bacteria are concentrated? From your calculation, it seems that the gut is where we have more bacteria? Or do you have other? Yeah. Well, in the ocean, that's why the surface is not enough, because in the ocean we have three dimensions, so they can be it's full of bacteria. Okay. Something like so that. The also, ocean. the soil, for example. The soil. Uh, all right. So, um, okay. So, I would say that the one that is the closest is this one, but it's still lower. <laughs> so, where is the thingy? All right. Uh, okay, so bacteria, we have about 10 to the 30 bacterial cells, and this is an estimation, probably a lower bound, and this estimation comes from a paper uh, published in 1998, but it's still extremely up to date, I would say. And, I would, and it, when we think about environments where bacteria are mostly concentrated, we have three, aquatic habitats, soils, and the subsurface. So everything that is below the first level of soil and below the sediments, the first layer of sediments in the ocean. So now what, what, 
the idea of this slide is just to tell you how the calculations were made based on some uh, measured quantities. And again, this is kind of the, the back of the envelope process that you guys did, which was extremely, it's the way to do it. But probably the thing is that um, basing things on uh, the gut microbiome probably was not the wisest choice. But of course, uh, this is what you guys knew, so that, but it's still a good way of thinking. Um, so, this is um, the, how the oceans, we can divide the oceans based on uh, mostly light penetration. So we have the, uh, this is the continental shelf and the first 200 meters where there is a lot of light and we have this number of cells. This has been measured, so these are averages. So people have been going around and taking samples in the ocean and this is the average cells, five per 10 to the five cells per milliliter. Okay, and this is true in the continental shelf and in the, in the, in the open ocean. And then we have all the, uh, uh, the volume uh, of water that is below 200 meters and here it is, it's slightly lower uh, and is 0.5 per 10 to the 5 cells per milliliter. But one thing that is important to know is, for example, that among these uh, 5 to the uh, times 10 to the 5 cells per milliliter, in the upper ocean, uh, the majority of cells are represented by these uh, uh, photosynthetic microbes. This is Prochorococcus. Uh, is a cyanobacterium. It has, discovered, it has been discovered only recently uh, because it, it's not, it was not culturable and uh, so it was detected by genomic techniques. And it was discovered by, by Penny Chisholm at, that, is, that is at MIT actually. And um, so the way we do the calculations now we know uh, the volume of uh, uh, water that we have on the continental shelf, the volume of the water in the upper, o in the upper ocean and the volume of the water in, the, uh, in, this lower in this lower part here. Usually it's also considered marine, the um, 10 centimeters of the sediments that are in connection with the water column. And this is because uh, the, the mixing and the uh, precipitation, uh, basically the, the result is that the interface uh, is uh, inexistent and they, co they are considered basically the same environment. And also here we have a very large number of cells because it's uh, is more than 10 to the 5, it's actually uh, 10 to the, to the 8 here. Um, and then for aquatic environments, again, we have the, the uh, rivers and uh, lakes have actually uh, an order of magnitude more cells compared to the ocean on average, and we have the volume, and if we do the calculations, uh, we arrive that uh, in, in the oceans that are basically 10 to, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 uh, uh, bacterial cells. But this is not, we are far away from 10 to the 30, right? It's an order of magnitude less. So it's almost not negligible, but still not what drives uh, this number. Um, so the other thing that we can look at are soils. And there have been estimates of number of cells in the soil. And uh, again, we can make a distinction between the upper soil and the lower soil and areas of the earth from the forest to deserts. And the thing that was surprising to me when I was reading these papers is that actually desert and cultivated lands have more bacteria than forests. And this is something that I was not expecting actually. But again, we can calculate, uh, now I will skip the calculations, but um, again, we have the area of, uh, that is occupied by each habitat. We have an idea of uh, the number of cells uh, per gram of soil. And we have, again, to, to make cal these calculations, how much gram of soils there are in a, one meter, uh, in a cubic meter of soil. But if you do the calculation, this is still not 10 to the 30. We're still a couple of order of magnitude less. Uh, and so this is, again, not what is giving the largest contribution. The environment in which we have more cells is actually the subsurface. So all the sediments that for soils are below eight meters, so all the amount of soil that is below eight meters, and for marine sediment, all the amount of sediment that is below 10 centimeters. And of course, uh, the majority of cells, this is basically 
are in this top layer of the marine subsurface and the top layer of, so of the subsurface soil. And given that, and this basically occupies 20% of the Earth's surface, so it's, it's a lot. And um, you can see that, for example, the number of cells decreases as we go towards uh, basically the core, of, uh, the core center of our planet. And, it is be, it, and the bound that we can make here when, when we go to 4,000 meters is actually that we are at 125 degrees Celsius, which is basically the thermal limit uh, that is imposed by temperature all on uh, microbial growth. So also thermophilic bacteria, so those that like it hot, uh, cannot survive at these temperatures. So basically, you can, we can collect all these numbers and we can express it as a number of cells per uh, 10 to the 28. And the grand total is actually two orders of magnitude more. And the largest contribution comes from subsurface environments. Um, these calculations are all found in this uh, uh, paper here. It's really good. I invite you to read it. And uh, um, also the thought process is behind and where they got all the references is really interesting. About our beloved gut, um, where all the where we are human-centric, of course, so we think about the gut as an extremely important environment for microbes. And basically, the, the quantity, even though there are many, many bacterial cells on our skin, not just the gut, is still a negligible quantity compared to uh, the uh, bacteria that are in the rest of the environment. And these are just uh, the kind so here, actually, group four estimated the right amount of cells in the gut. This is the order of 10 to, 10 to the 23. Actually, yes, 10 to the 23. While cows is a bit more, is an order of magnitude more. So um, two things that I want, that I, here are interesting is uh, there are a lot of bacteria, first. And second, these uh, back of the envelope calculations are extremely interesting to estimate these quantities. And recently, there have been a couple of papers actually that use these calculations to, for example, estimate the number of ants on the Earth. This is another fun paper that just came out. And also, um, a back calculation of how much plankton diversity we should expect in the ocean. And these are two papers that, if you want to read, them, they're pretty fun to read. Okay, if you, if you don't have questions on this, yes. Um, all right. Is there any reason in principle why we would expect these kinds of environments that you showed to be um, the kinds of environments that are good for prokaryotic life to thrive? Because I, I think it's also very surprising, for instance, that the desert would be... Um, better for, for bacteria than forests. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't have an intuition either way, but it's interesting that it is that way, right? Yeah, so um, there is, I don't think that it, the, the question is really good. I don't think there is a, only one reason why this should happen. For example, uh, about deserts, uh, there is this idea, for example, that what, where you have higher temperatures, you have higher diversity, and this is a macroecological pattern that is observed uh, for many, many uh, organisms. Um, other reasons why they would thrive actually, oh, sorry. Um, of course, it's resources that affect the distribution, but also, is a mat I guess it's just a, a matter of surface and space. So you have more bacterial cells where you actually have more space, and I guess that's the, probably the stupidest thing that I could think about, but. Um, <laughs> These, the sediments are actually occupy the, the largest surface on, on, on Earth. And uh, also, well, the other thing that I have to say about subsurface is that we are understanding what's going on there and what microbes there are basically very, very slowly because um, there, are some, there are estimates, uh, there are samples only for the first layers. And then, for example, the, um, these uh, l these numbers here are actually extrapolations from linear regressions. So this paper here shows you how uh, from the numbers of cells that you have above and some relationship with the depth, you can arrive at the, at the, at, 
estimated numbers of bacterial cells. But the other thing that I maybe I should tell you is that, for example, for these environments, you can, you can get these numbers from different est estima estimation processes. And um, so it seems that even if you arrive from different sides of the calculations, you, get to the to, you arrive to the same number. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, we can discuss. We will discuss more on what uh, environmental factors actually are good for microbial growth, microbial diversity. All right. Do you want to add something, Jacopo? No, I was just thinking that uh, there is a difference between uh, the fact that they are very abundant uh, doesn't mean that they are growing a lot. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, especially in these deep sediments, uh, uh, there were estimates that they grow, like the, the, the doubling time is years. I mean, E. coli is 20 minutes in the lab, and these microbes just slowly grow. Um, yeah. Um, all right, the other thing that we might want to know is how much carbon there is stored in microbes. Uh, and especially depending on where they are, this is important when you think about uh, uh, sequestration processes that are extremely important for the carbon balance uh, in, the, in the environment and climate. So this is a, um, a Voronoi diagram of uh, estimates of how much carbon is stored in different organisms. And of course, plants are the uh, tigers here, meaning that they, they store the majority of carbon, but actually bacteria are doing a very decent job given the amount of cells that we have compared to animals. When we think about animals, that what we think about usually, they, they only store two uh, gigatons of carbon. So this is just to give you an idea of uh, how much uh, bacteria can weight in the balance of elements in, on Earth. And when, when we think about, for example, on uh, to climate models, the majority of the times they don't take into account microbes at all at, as sinks of carbon or, uh, emit or uh, as sources of carbon. We mostly focus on plants, which is correct given the amount of carbon, but still this is, this is a, a good percentage of carbon that is stored in bacteria. And here, the calculation is not extremely important, but basically you, for each environment, you can multiply the number of cells again by the, amount of, the estimated amount of carbon that is uh, supposed to be in a cell, which is between 11 and 80 femtograms of carbon. And these this calculations vary depending on the environment, um, but these are the usual estimates of uh, carbon content in cells. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, remind you, probably this is something that you've already seen in your life, is that, well, microbes have had a lot of time to occupy uh, basically every corner of Earth. Let's say that uh, Earth uh, originated 4.6 billion years ago, and uh, it is thought that uh, cellular life started about 3.8, 3.9 uh, billion years ago. And basically, if you, if you look at this diagram, the life on Earth has been exclusively microbial for most of its history, and it's still, microbes are still present to the day. And um, another important thing that I wanted to uh, highlight is that um, an important step for the evolution of life on Earth is the uh, starting of anoxygenic phototrophic activities. Uh, this means that microbes uh, started to be able to harvest light, harvest energy from sunlight, but and using as uh, um, electron acceptors, for example, organic elements or methane, like the methanogens, those that produce methane in the environment, uh, originated basically here. And then, and we still have methanogens in many environments on Earth. But probably the most important step is the origin of cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria are still phototrophic, but they can harvest energy from light, but actually the final product is oxygen. And this is a huge step because starting here, this, the process of oxygen, oxygenation on Earth started, and 
basically what li life as we know it started when uh, after uh, the um, atmosphere became oxygenated and given the amount of time that bacteria uh, um, are well spent on earth uh, we can only imagine how diverse uh, uh, bacterial life can be so I I don't know a lot about this tree but to me the most important thing is that uh, basically this was the first tree that was constructed from molecular information so after metagenomic techniques uh, were born uh, because basically before that we could only estimate the phylogeny based on um, properties of cells that could be seen at naked eye or growth properties or um, which growth media they could grow on but with metagenomic techniques actually people were able to uh, identify the phylogeny uh, based on ribosomal proteins and to me the only number that I wanted for you to remember is that there are 92 bacterial phyla that have a name and compared to for example five eukaryotic supergroups so the, the diversity that we see on Earth and we're still discovering is mesmerizing compared to, uh, for example, eukaryotes. So, so here, uh, the, so the idea is that evolution should, tend, should uh, actually progress towards complicating things. With bacteria, I don't know if it's, so we're still at the, at the level of, of, a, of, an, of, of, uh, of organization that is pretty basic. So still unicellular organisms. Um, and now I want to just to briefly tell you why we study microbes, uh, given that they are so diverse. For example, well, one simple process that we can think about is that they make our food. So th the majority of fermentation products that we eat today is based on fermentations that are brought on by microbes. And different cultures have different fermentation products from cheese to wine, but also kimchi. Uh, kefir, uh, you name it, uh, all these uh, fermentation uh, processes are uh, brought about uh, uh, microbes. Then there is uh, a huge, uh, of course, uh, effect on health protection and pr uh, provision of important molecules. For example, bacteria in our gut are those that are able to synthesize vitamin K that, that otherwise we could not get from the diet. And of course, there are tons of studies showing that there is, for example, a gut-brain axis. So bacteria that are in our gut not only affect the way we assimilate nutrients, but also uh, how our mood uh, develops, uh, depression. So uh, this gut-brain axis is still in development, but it's extremely interesting in the sense that uh, there are still many things to be discovered. And finally, what, what is most, I, probably I care most about is the fact that microbes are involved in biogeochemical processes and they regulate, for example, the, um, the uh, uptake and emission of greenhouse gases. So, for example, CO2 uh, is fixed by uh, plants and then can be stored in soil, actually, thanks to uh, the microbial biomass that is then present in the lower level of soils. And then microbes are also involved in the production of uh, greenhouse gases, for example, methane and nitrous oxide. And so when we think again about all the balances between nutrients and, uh, and climate, uh, microbes play a huge role. And finally, the other element that is extremely important and this, its cycle is regulated by microbes is nitrogen. And now I just, now I, I didn't have it there, but basically we have nitrogen in the at atmosphere and it's fixed into ammonia by um, nitrogen fixing bacteria that, has, that are mostly in plants. So there, are, there is this symbiosis between uh, uh, legumes and uh, rhizobia in terms of uh, plant, and these microbes fix nitrogen into ammonia. There are other microbes that instead can uh, produce uh, uh, nit uh, nitrite. Um, and also the production of nitrates depend also on the composition that produces um, uh, ammonium and uh, nitrite can be converted always by microbes in uh, 
uh, nitrate, that is actually what is needed by plants, so this is a plant, uh, this is a, an important element for plants, and then there are other bacteria that end the cycle and replenish uh, the, nitro the um, uh, nitrogen in, in the atmosphere. For example, in this process here is where, for example, nitrous oxide, which is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas, is, is, is released. So when bacteria are not able to finish the conversion from uh, uh, nitrate to N2, what, we, what it is liberated is in ni its ni uh, nitrous oxide. And there are, it is extremely important to study this process because uh, this gas is like, I don't remember how many times more potent uh, uh, than CO2, but it's actually so playing a huge role in the um, um, uh, heating of the planet, sorry. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. It's beyond basically the scope of this class, unfortunately. There's a lot to say and uh, a lot to discover. But one important point that I want to make is that all these processes rarely depend from one single species, but uh, are the result of the interactions between hundreds of species that are organized in communities. So this is actually the focus of microbial ecology, try to understand how these communities uh, assemble, how these communities function, and how the environment basically uh, shape the uh, outcome of the community outcomes. And so this is the idea that we want to give you about microbial community ecology, and we will, go in, we will focus on some environmental uh, constraints on community outcomes. Um, all right, so this was the, uh, basically the first part, a sort of overview. And do you have any questions? Because the next part is mostly about, uh, is an overview of the method, of the methods. Or oh, you have curiosity questions. So. Then I'll move forward. All right, so uh, this is mostly, uh, curio well, this is basically the history some of the history of uh, microbial methods. So the first um, actually reported, um, written report of uh, microbes seen, actually uh, seen microbes, is from 1665 by Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke designed the first microscope, basically, and he was able to see uh, the first structure of uh, uh, not bacterial cells, but, basic, but mostly molds. And all these molds, this is, a, this is a picture of the fruiting bodies of molds. And um, it's very nice because then Robert Hooke drew all the things that he was seeing and finally published a book that is called Micrographia that uh, there was a, actually an exhibition by the Royal Society and you can find some of the pictures uh, uh, on the website of the Royal Society, if you're curious, they're very nice. I, I really like them. Okay, this is the first observation, but actually uh, the first person to actually see bacteria for the first time was Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, uh, and uh, basically published the results of his studies on, uh, with, micro with, my, mm, with the microscope in a series of letters that he sent to the Royal uh, Society of London, and then they were translated in English. Uh, for the consumption of basically the rest of the, of the world. And the nice thing about it is that he was calling microbes we anim animalcules. And, uh, and, and the nice, so for example, this is a drawing of the bacteria that Van Leeuwenhoek got from his uh, teeth. So this is his plaque, and he was able to isolate the microbes that he had in his mouth. Possibly disgusting, but uh, a milestone for, uh, for uh, microbial ecology. And, and of course, the, uh, the limit here was uh, the potency of, uh, of uh, microscopes that were still, I would say, uh, very artisanal and uh, homemade by, by, these two, uh, by these two people in the, 16th, in the 17th century. I, I always make, have troubles counting. It's probably 15th century. Okay. <laughs> All right, but then the other 
The other person extremely important for microbial ecology is Ferdinand Kuhn. Uh, and actually was studying unicellular algae and bacteria because many, many people started using microbes, building microbes to see these uh, weird animals that uh, the, naked eye, the naked eye could not distinguish. And one important contribution of Ferdinand Kern to uh, the uh, field of microbiolo microbiology was the discovery of heat, so he was studying heat resistance and he's actually the one that discovered endospores. And he was studying the cycle of, uh, of bacillus spe species and he discovered that in the cycle there was this uh, dormancy stage that was allowing the, the, these species to overcome uh, heat. So basically, se live cells of bacillus da died when you heat them, while spores would survive heating. And also an important thing is that he laid the groundwork for a classification uh, system in bacteria and also for other methods in microbiology. For example, uh, the flask, covering the flask with cotton uh, as a way to uh, avoid contamination was invented by Kuhn. Now we, we have other methods, but still, um, uh, I mean, he laid the groundwork for a lot of methods that we still use in microbiolo microbiology. Then the other person that basically revolutionized, revolutionized microbiology is Louis Pasteur. And among other things, um, well, he uh, basically defeated the, the spontaneous generation theory. Uh, he also was studying wine maladies and discovered how in certain cases uh, wine would go bad and uh, basically saved the French winery from disaster by discovering uh, alternative stable states in wines. And also it's famous for developing vaccines, including Drebis vaccine. But I just wanted to show you how it, maybe you already, you already know about this, but uh, this is how um, Pasteur uh, defeated the spontaneous generation. So the, the idea is that when you, um, if you leave something, and uh, you wait for a while, you will see that this, for example, piece of meat would putrefy. And the idea is that uh, somehow uh, this putre uh, putrefaction process was due to a spontaneous generation. While Pasteur was basically against this theory and devised a very clever method to uh, defeat this theory, to um, uh, basically demonstrate the alternative hypothesis. Uh, so the idea is that you can, you can pour non-sterile liquid in, in a flask and then uh, to try to, his idea is that the, these, the putref putrefaction process starts with air and dust that contains microbes uh, contaminating the, uh, the, uh, the piece of meat or the liquid and this would induce the process of microbial activities and then what it was called the putrefaction. Um, so to avoid that, he basically did a, a, th a very clever thing. So he um, put a, a flame under the neck of this flask and these flasks are, are known as uh, swan flasks and they are still used. And in this way he was able to avoid that air coming from uh, above would reach the liquid. The other thing is that, okay, I have a non-sterile liquid, how do I st sterilize it? Well, he discovered that by intensive heating, uh, one can sterilize a liquid. This is a process that we're still using today. Even the process of pasteurization uh, comes from Pasteur. Um, well, let's say you sterilize this liquid and you have this liquid that slowly cools down. And in the end, if the, mm, if, thanks to the, to the neck, uh, this one neck of this flask, the liquid was always separated from dust and air coming from outside. And in this way, it could show that even after a long time, the, the liquid would change properties. And this was an indication of no microbial activity, basically, and so no changes in the media. Um, and then he showed that if you bend the, if you tilt the flask and in this way the liquid reaches the air that is trapped in the bend of the flask, then you, you basically put in contact these microbes with an, an interesting source of nutrients and in this way the process of putrefaction starts. Or we, we could say to that the microbial activity starts. Okay, this was just because I think uh, this was just to give you an overview of what Pasteur did and why and how clever he was in, this, in uh, 
falsifying the spontaneous generation. The last person that I want to tell you about is Robert Koch. And uh, everyone probably knows the, the germ theory of disease and how Koch, with his postulates, revolutionized how we discover disease that, that, has, that are caused by microbes. And this is just a figure with the overview of the uh, postulates. The uh, Koch was studying anthrax, uh, which, which was a disease that was mostly observed in cattle and was a disaster for many farmers. And in studying that, he realized that all the cows that were ill or diseased, in their blood, they had a bug, basically. And so based on this idea, he developed the first postulate that um, if, you, if you suspect that, that, that a pathogen is causing a disease, then this pathogen should be always present in the diseased animals and always absent in the healthy animals. And at this point, if you, if you are able to isolate the pathogen, then this pathogen must be grown in uh, pure culture. And um, this actually laid the groundwork for how, we are, for how microbes were studied for many, many years. So these pure cultures were the base of microbial ecology and microbiology for a century. And the, the third postulate basically says that the cells from a pure culture of the suspended pathogen must be inoculated into the, uh, to healthy animals, and these animals must become diseased. And finally, you, you must be able to re-isolate the pathogen from these uh, infected animals, and this pathogen should be identical to the original one. And this seems a logical process, but actually this, what, this is what sets the base for uh, basically microbiology, disease biology, and uh, infectious disease, uh, the study of infectious diseases. And well, as I told you before, the uh, pure culture method is like the, the gold standard of my microbiology. And there have been only a couple of improvements. For example, uh, Robert Koch was using gelatin to isolate bacteria in, in uh, basically um, sli um, slices of this uh, solidified gel. But this was a bit annoying because at 37 degrees, that where, is, where most bacteria grow very fast, the gelatin was li would liquefy. So it was a problem. So actually, the Fanny S, that is the wife of Walter S, suggested that instead of using gelatin, well, why not using agar? She was using it for making jellies and marmalades. And so uh, it is thought that she suggested to use agar instead of gelatin. And that's how we have the uh, solid media that we use in, uh, in microbial ecology. And uh, because this, it has numerous properties, not just the fact that it doesn't solidify at 37 degrees. Also, for example, that uh, it's transparent, so it allows you to see all the different colonies. And finally, that um, it's not consumed in principle by bacteria, while gelatin is usually consumed. So this, is a, this basically revolutionized the way we, uh, we grow bacteria in pure cultures and not only pure cultures. And finally, last but not least, uh, petri dishes. So this um, Richard Petri at a certain point said, okay, these rectangular slides are not useful, and came up with this brilliant, de brilliant design of uh, circular uh, plates with a cover that to actually be tilted. And in this way, not only it was easy to see across uh, the, uh, the, the agar, but also it would avoid contamination because it would cover the... Uh, uh, the agar. And also, petri dishes are stackable, and if you've ever been in a microbiology lab, there are stacks of petri dishes everywhere. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the Richard Lensky experiment, the long-term evolution of E. coli. They have a, like rooms full of uh, uh, stacks of petri dishes because they use them to isolate the, the mutated strains and uh, they kept them, and the volume is huge. Um, last thing, um, last two people. Uh, Martinez Bejerink uh, started, uh, discovered how to isolate microbes from the environment using the enrichment culture method that I will tell you more about it uh, afterwards. But basically, if you start from a uh, sample from outside, 
uh, you can find ways to selectively, uh, se selectively isolate uh, specific bugs. Uh, and this is, for example, how uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria were discovered. Um, and finally, maybe everyone knows about Vinograski. He's famous for, for uh, basically having discovered chemolithography, chemolithotrophy and nitrogen fixation through uh, these flasks that are microcosms in which bugs can grow and then uh, single species can be isolated. Um, okay, so this was just a historic, uh, uh, how am I doing with time? Very good, okay. Um, this is just some history uh, about uh, methods. Uh, but you can already see that for basically uh, 200 years, uh, microbiology was based on cultures. So culture dependent methods. And um, here I just, it's just to show you how the enrichment culture method developed by Bejerink uh, would work. So you start from a, a soil sample or whatever sample you want. You inoculate it into a selective medium and if you want to extract a certain species, you uh, basically provide the environment that is ideal for this species. So it can be a medium with specific resources. Uh, it can be in incubated without oxygen and this you are going to select for an anaerobic bacteria. It can be a certain temperature and all these conditions would select for certain species. And then in some case, if, then you can play this, um, uh, this suspension after growth. And again, pl plates can be selective. So different media, different agar media, different incubation condition. And you end up with having single species. Um, this was a just um, a picture of the Vinogradsky columns. And this is another way of enriching cultures because this is, you can, if you, if you, if you ever done a vinograsis column is, is, is quite fun because basically you can go to a pond, you can get some sediment, you can cover it with, and you, these sediments must be mixed a bit. And usually mm, certain uh, nutrients are provided. Uh, sulfate, for example, must be provided and also car calcium carbonate. And then you cover the mud with, this, with the water of the pond and you seal the environment. And this creates uh, a, basically an enclosed ecosystem in which different microbial populations will develop. And the different st uh, strata here indicate different metabolisms. And if you go to this website, there are all, all the instructions to make a Vinograsky column. It makes a very good uh, piece of furniture, not furniture, but decoration. Um, but scientifically, this was a way to enrich for center species that then could be isolated. Um, isolation, usually what we do, and we still do it today, uh, it's, based, it's important to, to, to try to study a single species. It's important to obtain pure cultures. So if we start from a Petri dish in which we have several colony morphologies, these colony morphologies can be picked and uh, by multiple streaking procedures, and maybe here, I don't know about uh, if I say streaking, does it ring a bell to you or? No, great. Um, let's say that I have, uh, this is a Petri dish and these are bugs. These are colony morphologies. These are actually my plates from soil. And uh, we have these sticks, these are like this, those are loops that allow you to pick a single colony. And then with streaking, you have your Petri dish. And um, the, fir the first time you, the, with the first stick, you do a sort of, uh, you brush the surface of the agar. Then you change the stick and you start from here and you do another, another um, brush and finally, you, and you continue changing the stick while brushing. And the idea is that with this process, you rarefy the cells till you're able to have one cell, for example here, that will originate a clonal population. 
with the clonal population, then you can obtain a, pul a pure culture. Is this clear? Or, I mean, this is something that we still do like this, nothing changed from uh, 200 years ago. Um, but yeah, so here the most important thing to remember is that, again, these are all metho methods that are based on uh, uh, culturing microbes. And what we know now is that basically only 1% of bacterial species are actually culturable. And so all these methods introduced a huge bias in the way we study microbial species because in the end we end up studying these friendly species like E. coli. But basically 99% of the microbial diversity is still, uh, and we cannot characterize it in these old ways because we cannot grow them. Either because we don't know the conditions, we cannot reproduce them in the lab, or because some microbes actually need other community members to, to grow for, I don't know, for, like for us, we need vitamin K, we need microbes to produce it for us. All right, so the revolution here came with um, techniques, the so-called culture-independent techniques that basically analyze the DNA that is extracted directly from a sample. And, um, and basically, th through these uh, culture-independent techniques, we, we, are, we were able to understand and basically record the diversity of microbial communities. The revolution started with this biophysicist, Carl Woz, uh, that with George Fox, basically published a method to, um, well, the idea uh, was to try to, to define uh, a, the new tree of life, or at least to try to get a tree of life. And uh, in doing that, uh, the idea that they had was, okay, if, we, if, you, need to, if you want to construct, construct a comprehensive uh, phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree, instead of basically sequencing all the possible genes, which is A, impossible, B, time-consuming, C, extremely expensive, we should probably look for a marker gene, so a, a candidate gene that had two important characteristics. The first one that everyone, every organism has it, and the second one is that mutates very slowly in time, because in this way you can use it as a clock to track mutation across lineages and in time. And they identify the 16S RNA gene in prokaryotes, which is, has the counterpart that is the 18S gene in eukaryotes, that basically exactly has these properties. It's everywhere, and it has a region that mutates very slowly, but also variable regions that instead uh, are, are called variable regions because they differ a lot between different species. And in this way, they were able not only to, they opened a new field that is based on the sequencing of the 16S to uh, define community properties, but also they discovered archaea. So they, actually the, the huge uh, message in this paper was the discovery of a different uh, uh, branch of the tree that were archaea. Um, now in the, 10, 15 minutes that we have, I thought that we can, if, you've, if you end up uh, being, uh, looking at ways to uh, uh, study microbial communities, just to give you an idea of what are the techniques that are based on, uh, that are culture independent and are based on, on genomes uh, that you can use. Okay. Um, when we have microbial communities, the first step is basically to extract the DNA. So this is how you get the material that then you need to sequence. And um, DNA extraction usually happens with a combination of mechanical leases of cells and chemical leases of the cell, um, which means that um, you have your sample, which, can, which you don't know how many species it contains, and mechanically, usually with beads, you destroy the tougher cells, usually, for example, gram-negative that have strong, uh, uh, strong outer membranes. And 
and then you can add chemical lysis by which you break the, the cells and the final product is a, is a solution that has a lot of DNA inside. And then you can take two different uh, paths. One is the one opened by Carl Rose that is based on a 16S. And it's, it's known as 16S amplicon sequencing or, in other, or metabarcoding. And the idea is that um, imagine that you, uh, that you have your population and you are scanning with a magnet for 16S genes. These are your target genes. And then what you, it's based on amplification of the genes. So the, uh, there are PCR reactions that uh, repro reproduce, so amplify the 16S genes. So you have a lot of this gene in your solution. And finally, with some, then there is the sequencing part that uh, usually is proprietary, like Illumina. So the actual, so the, the processes are known, but uh, machines, uh, there is a machine that does it, and I'm not going to the details of this because I don't know exactly. So I, I, I've seen videos, but um, you can see them as well if, on YouTube, but it's a bit too much for me. But basically, what the end products are sequences that then using, using clustering algorithms, you, um, cluster into a group of similar sequences. For example, the most common way to classify uh, these sequences is using a 97% threshold of similarity that yields OTUs. Uh, OTUs are, uh, is the acronym for Operational Taxonomic Unit, and basically is telling you, okay, this bunch of sequences perhaps belong to something to, to it's not really a species, but Again, it's something that is close enough to a species. And more recently, instead of using this 97% threshold, many more people are forgetting about threshold and saying that everything that has at least one nucleotide of difference is considered a, a, a species or whatever a strain, and what is usually called is amplicon sequence variant. Just to give you an idea on how this is, um, how the 16S works, which to me is the most interesting part. Um, this is your, the 16S part that you're interested in. Um, usually there are different regions depending on the, uh, what you want to know about your sample. Uh, for example, there is v1, the V1, V2 region, which is the, this is the variable part that is usually uh, useful for skin microbes. So when you see studies targeting skin microbes, this is the variable part that the, uh, um, the amplicon sequencing is targeting. And then the most um, common one is the V4 region that is usually, for example, everyone in sequence gut microbiomes use the V4 variable region, or um, sometimes for completeness use the V5, um, the V5. But basically, if you want to catch them all, usually the, uh, the region, the variable region that you go for is the, is the V4. And then you use the conserved parts to attach barcodes that basically are those that allow the PCR reaction to happen to amplify this, re to, to amplify this region. This is where barcodes go. And finally, if, depending on the sequencing platform, if you have multiple samples, you can attach other primers that allow you to distinguish whether this sample that you, if you have, for I don't know, for example, many, many samples, this is, uh, a primer that, tell you, that tells you this was uh, sample one and another one was sample two. So in this way, you can throw everything in a, in a lane of these machines, and then at the end of the sequencing procedure, you have uh, sample one, a list of sequences that you either have clustered into what to use, or you've decided that you are going for ASVs, and each of these dif is a difference, they differ by one nucleotide. Is this sufficiently clear? More or less? More or less. All right. 
Um, the other way you can go is using metag metagenomics. The, di the main difference, so we, you still have your community sample and you still extract the DNA, but this time you're not targeting one specific gene, you're targeting all the genes that you're able to recover, and importantly, there is no amplification. So there is no barcoding uh, of 16S because you don't need to target basically any gene. And uh, what you end up having are called uh, metagenomic assembled genomes that are basically the equ sort of equivalent, uh, idealized equivalent of OTUs. And just to give you an idea of how this procedure works, I said this is your community with many, many bacteria, and each one have a genome. Maybe I should use different colors. From the DNA extraction, you get a huge ensemble of short, uh, these are called short reads, so they are fragments of DNA that the sequencing procedure has generated. Tick, 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 tick. Now there are also long reads, but basically the most common ones, less expensive also, are short reads. And then here, with these short reads, you want to come up uh, with uh, community composition or uh, community structure, let's say. And you have two possibilities. The first one is that there are some referent genes. For example, there are databases where genomes of, uh, the full genome of certain organisms has been mapped, and you can recover them. And then you can, for example, if this is uh, reference genome one, this, you can align these short reads uh, with the pieces of genome to which they uh, uh, correspond to. This is called recruiting. And then you basically end up with, uh, I say this is the second one. You end up with two metagenome assembled, no, this is yellow. These are two mugs, okay? And this is left with a ton of other short reads that you didn't know, don't know where they are. So the other thing that you can do is called the novo assembly. So based on characteristics of the DNA, like GC content and other features, you can basically reconstruct. So you, the, the first operation is to get longer uh, fragments of DNA that are called contigs. And then as the, this, so sorry, this is mapping. And this is instead the novo assembly. So you don't have reference genes, but based on some features, you uh, reconstruct uh, contig, and then you are able to, again, to reconstruct uh, uh, mugs. And in this way, with these two, pro then these two processes, you end up basically in this situation, in which you have two references again, and you can Again, recruit reads from the original pool that weren't matched with any of these. So it's a long process. There is a lot of computation going on. There are many, many algorithms to do the de novo uh, assembly, but also the mapping. And um, there are a lot of people that are working on these algorithms, but this is the, at the frontier of what is, uh, that are the techniques that we're using to uh, understand microbial communities. <coughs> so this is a bit rushed, but this is just to give you an idea of what you're doing with what you get, the, the DNA that you get. There are many papers that you can read in which you can find uh, specifics about this project. And the other thing, the final thing that I want to show you is actually how these two methods differ and why in certain cases we want to use one and how, why in certain cases we want to use another one. So for example, the metabarcoding 
or amplicon, uh, synchronous synchronous amplicon is very good if you want to have an idea of the diversity and the taxonomy because you can match all these sequences with database like Green Gene and Silva and recover your taxonomy for all the communities that you've sampled. On the other hand, uh, there are a lot of amplification biases. So not all the six, not all the six in S of each species or whatever thing you have in the sample would amplify in the same way. So you can end up amplifying more of a species that not necessarily is the one that is more represented in that community. And finally, there is another little uh, caveat is that um, certain uh, species have multiple copies of this R16 S gene. And so basically these are, can be overrepresented in a community. So for example, if, you, if a species has three copies of the 16S gene, this gene will be amplified more compared to a species that has one copy. There are ways to correct this, but this is another thing that is important to keep in mind. If you, the, I would say that the huge advantage of the metagenome is that you, you can go beyond the taxonomy and look at the potential function. Because if you forget that you want to target species, what you're actually looking at uh, is the genomic content of a community. So basically, which genes uh, are there with the idea of the potential function that these genes are performing in the environment? It's just the potential because it not, it's not necessarily that these genes are, are, are translated, transcripted, sorry. So if we really want to go into uh, the realized function, the other, the, other, the other technique that we have is the metatranscriptome. It's the same thing as the metagenome, but instead of sequencing the DNA, you are sequencing the RNA that has been transcripted. And this is, you have an idea of what genes were actually doing something in that community. And so this is, for example, is this species was photosynthesizing or this species were degrading a specific compound? And this is, and of course, both the, metag the metagenomic and the metatranscriptomics are pr have problems and mostly are due to uh, the, the sequencing depth. So how much, how, how many of these uh, short reads you can actually align, and which gives you an idea of actually how many of these gene or species you have in that community. This depends a lot on the depth and the coverage of the sequencing. So it depends also on the facility. Um, the final thing that I want to tell you about this, which was a lot for a, an hour and a half, uh, <laughs> but it's just to give you an overview because otherwise uh, we will use certain terms uh, uh, that maybe then we don't, we don't understand each other, is that these are all clustering techniques. The OTUs is a clustering technique, the read recruitment is a clustering technique. And this is a problem that we have with bacteria because we, we, we are not able to define a species. So what really separates microbiology from any other biology of whatever organisms is that the concept of species is loose. Uh, because a species can have multiple strains, these multiple strains can be different. So the, the clustering, within a clustering, sorry, not a species, you can have strains doing different things. And this is new basically for, this is a new biology that we are facing. And, um, and yes, this is, was a lot again, uh, but if you are curious about, uh, for example, terms that we use in metagenomic, I invite you to go to the Anvio website where there are all these different technique, ex techniques explained, what is a contig compared to a short read. I said it here, but I understand that it was a bit fast. And, um, and with this, for today, I think that could be it. Um, questions? Yes. Uh, I have a question regarding the difference between OTUs AS and ASVs. You said ASVs uh, counts just a single difference, yeah. like a single nucleotide. Yes. Uh, doesn't that account? Does that doesn't account for like errors in reading? Does it? No. I Would mean, would that make like a huge difference in a community situation? Possibly not, or possibly yes. That's the, that's. I think that's the thing. So you don't know whether this is identifies two different species, or two strains. And th with the 16s, you don't know what they're doing. And the other thing, you don't even know if the cell is actually 
growing because you are just crushing all the DNA and the 16S of that species is there. So can be within the error. Yeah, I, I understand the face. But <laughs> that's what we're trying to discover. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Regarding, um, I mean, what you do to construct ASVs is that you correct, you sort of do this process of denoising. So you yeah. correct uh, for uh, sequencing, you try to correct for sequencing errors. So basically the idea is, suppose that you have a sequence which is very abundant because they it present in many copies in the, in the community. And suppose that sometimes, I mean, there was an error. You, what you expect is that close to that sequence, you have a sequence in low numbers, right? And uh, if you assume that the errors are like, uh, pos are like uh, Poisson independent, et cetera, et cetera, you, ex you expect a distribution of sequences close to a very abundant sequence based on what is the baseline error. So basically you have methods, which you can think at black box, but are based on this idea to correct, to remove these errors here. There are so supervised uh, learning method, unsupervised. Uh, you can find <laughs> all the yeah. beasts. Uh, um, that you want. There was another question there. Can you say your name when you ask questions? That maybe we'll try to memorize them. Uh, my name is Benjamin. Um, so I guess I think it's very interesting that it, compared to uh, these uh, bacterial colonies and so on, these are a relatively recent discovery. These uh, microbial communities and thinking about you know there being these microbial communities that are living under the soil in the desert or something like that they, it feels somewhat remote like do, do we have um an idea now of how these uh communities might be affecting the ecosystems we're more used to working with what what their uh relevance is for uh, questions of ecosystem stability I mean, they are themselves an ecosystem, but like the ecosystem's ability at no, the no, scale are that people, are, yes. No, 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 this is, this is a good question. And I would say the answer is uh, trying, we're trying to get to these answers actually. So the thing is, for example, that I would, the, the nitrogen cycle that was written here is that the fact that for, so for, ex let's say, let's take microbes that are in um, these environments like salt marshes, uh, uh, where those environments uh, were thought to have to be carbon sinks. So you, that carbon is trapped by, for example, the plants of the marshes, and then microbes decompose it, and then microbes are in the ground, and, and carbon is stored there. But actually, the process, for example, of, um, but if there are carbon sinks, the, the thing that was not taken into account is that there are microbes that use that carbon to produce to uh, harvest energy from CO2, and the end product is methane. So for example, this is a function that, okay, we know it for about, I don't know, 10, 20 years, but the balance uh, between how much an environment is a sink of carbon or a source of uh, uh, a greenhouse gas is still, we're still understanding it now because we are still trying to understand what are the conditions, for example, the favor the uh, activity of methanogens. And it's the same with nitrogen. Uh, how much nitrogen is, how much amount nitrogen comes back to the atmosphere as N2 or as nitrous oxide depends on the activity of the microbes that uh, do the last step from uh, nitrate to, uh, to N2. And for example, oxygen changes these, these activities the temperature changes these activities. And so whether you have uh, N2, which is okay, coming, coming back to the atmosphere, or whether actually there is this byproduct, this nitrous oxide, is, we're still trying, so. Um, microbes are relevant, but for, and there are, sing, there are many, many studies on different environments, different ecosystems. Uh, uh, experiments with uh, simplified culture that are, that are telling us these things. But for example, microbes are not integrated into climate models. So this is a huge oversight. 
And if you read the last uh, IPCC panel, so the, the, this uh, uh, book that is uh, produced by people that care about the, the climate in principle, but there is no mention of microbes there. And this is 2022, and we know about microbes and climate for about 10 years. So there was a paper actually saying, look, we should think about microbes in 2019. So there is, uh, the point is that we're still at trying to understand how the environment itself, like resources, temperature, affect these communities and their activities. So we're still at this stage. So there's hope, but. <laughs> um, other things? Good. Then see you tomorrow. It's going to be less dense starting from tomorrow, I, I promise. <laughs> I mean, yes, compared to all of this, I think so.